I know there's a lot out there competing for our attention, uh, even in Norway. I don't know if, you, if things are as crazy in Norway as they are in the United States right now, so I thank you for being here. I'd like to find out, usually before I speak, has anybody here, or who here has been to Syria? Okay, wow. The outperforming the American crowds. Um, and then I like to ask, who, how many people know a Syrian? Okay. <laughs> And in the USA, you know, now that we have um, President Trump, I also like to ask how many want, know a Syrian who was banned? <laughs> or heard of one that was banned? <laughs> yeah. Or heard of Syria before the ban? But this is, you guys seem like you're an educated crowd, so. Um, well, you're all welcome here. Time is short, and apparently you guys are actually keeping time. We're keeping Norwegian time, not not Syrian time? Okay, um, so this is not comprehensive, this is not authoritative, but it is a few thoughts. And what you're seeing cycling behind me, because I was sort of, a, I had a heavy ask. I was asked to talk about the book, talk about something intelligent and deep about like existentialist ideas about home. Um, so I don't know if any of that's gonna happen, but if I get boring, you can just look at this pretty slideshow behind me, which sort of like captures part of the scenes of the book, but I'm not gonna talk too much about the book. Um, just because I'm sick of talking about the book. I think the idea is that because the book is called The Home That Was Our Country, a memoir of Syria, that I might have something to say on this topic specifically. Um, but Zane, I didn't tell you this, but that was actually not my chosen title for the book. Um, my chosen title for the book did not have the word home in it even. Um, and they initially wanted to call it the home that was my country. And that sort of when you have one of these epic battles with a publisher and you just, you have to put your foot down because I don't really think of this as my story. It's sort of, um, it's very Machiavellian, you know, I sort of used, used my family and used this house to tell a story, but it's, for me, it's truly the story, the story of a country. Um, and I'm also, I've grown tired of sort of being the Syrian, you know, the palatable, the palatable Syrian that, um, you know, I don't really care what I think of as home anymore because in the kind of face of the sort of displacement and destruction that we've seen of late, it seems, um, seems wrong to, to, to focus on that. But what doesn't change is that the metaphor that's at the center of the book does indeed link the idea of a family home to a country. And it was really a way to, wait, to, to weave the personal and the, and the political. Um, long story, oh sorry. Long story short, um, there were the sorts of parallels between our, our actual house in Damascus and the country that, like I said, as a writer, and you know, we are we are these horrible creatures that are, you know, a kind of, you know, we're vultures in a way. We sort of are looking um, for ways to make meaning out of out of out of things that are around us, and sometimes at the expense of our own families. Somebody once told me that to have a writer in the family is like having an assassin always nearby, <laughs> and I think that is not untrue. But in, in our case, we had a house that my grandmother had come to as a new bride when the country was new that was a new house in itself uh, in the late 40s, um, at the same time that Syria emerged from, from French um, tyranny, and uh, she also had emerged from her father's house, married, and went straight into her husband's house, but it was actually the house was in her name. And so she moved in at the same time that Syria was a new country. She raised my mother in it. And then in 1970, when my mom was 20 and in university, uh, she decided that the house would be for my mother, but that she wanted a bigger and a, and a nicer house. So she rented out the apartment uh, that you see in some of these pictures behind me that I keep knocking off somehow. I don't know how I'd keep doing that. Anyway, um, to a man from the military about a month before Hafez al-Assad, who since you guys all seem so smart, you know is the dictator that took power, control of Syria, and it's the same regime that is still, still in power. So in 1970, she brought in a, a tenant and she signed a, she told him that my mother would be getting married in the in the coming years and that this house was for her so they signed a lease and President Hafez al-Assad was supposedly also staying for a fixed term. But in the end, neither, neither man would leave. Neither our tenant left nor Hafez al-Assad left. Uh, and this was the outcome that was sort of sanctioned by, by Syrian property law. Um, and it became a major reason for our not returning to Syria. We happened to be in the United States for a short for a short time, and then there's also a murder in our family that is com committed by impunity um, by somebody affiliated with the state. So the, the, these were the two major reasons that we didn't go back. And then the property law changed in 2004, and we entered into this battle with the tenant to remove him, and, and it allowed us to remove him by paying 40% of the value of the house. So we had to fight over what the value of the house was. But at the very end of 2010, we got our house back, and. Um, 
at that point, having been a human rights attorney and then a journalist, I was only in Syria ever as you know, a, you know, a fond, a daughter fond of the you know homeland, returning for nice extended visits. But these are the sorts of vocations that can put your life. You just can't be a lawyer and a journal, a human rights lawyer and a journalist in Syria in an authoritarian state. And if you don't know why, ask me. We can ask me later. Um, so. But then what had happened was that we, with the Arab Spring, in the beginning of the Arab Spring, I desperately wanted to be there. And we had just gotten the house back. So I kind of had a cover story. So should the Mukhabarat sort of have questions as to why I would be in Syria at that time? You know, I was visibly doing a, re a renovation of a house. And I was drawn to this metaphor that I would be sort of restoring a house at the same time that a people was taking their country back because it was clear that things were starting in the region. And even though, I, you know, as I'm fond of saying, even though I was born in 1974, what was happening in 2011 was something I felt like I had been waiting for since 1967. Um, was sort of when the, you sort of saw these defeats of of the you know of Arab nationalism and the and the Arab armies. So, I thought you know, I we had gotten our house back 40 years later. It looked like maybe the Syrian regime, which had been in power for 40 years, might be coming to an end. And I was drawn, as again, as these, you know, as it was, we are vultures, as writers, drawn to this metaphor that I might be restoring a house at the same time as a people took its country back. Instead, as you all know, the metaphor crumbled, and I found myself putting the house back together as the country came apart. That coming apart happened on many levels and in many ways, but for anyone following the news, even in the lightest of senses, you know that the destruction of homes as both physical houses, cities, towns, and displacement, both voluntary, voluntary as in you agree to be evacuated and forced, has been a large part of it. And so while I was in Syria working on my book, I had the opportunity and, uh, and the obligation to try to understand how it came apart and when it began to come apart. So in the time that I have with you, I want to tell you of a few of these threads that I followed of Syria's unraveling, because I only have a few minutes, um, that led me to questions that I still struggle with and that perhaps we can interrogate together. And mainly, that is, when home, comes, when home becomes unattainable, what replaces it? And I should say that I don't like to answer questions. I don't see that as my job. I'm not a philosopher or a professor. Um, I just like to ask the questions. And, and I always find that people around me are more intelligent, and, and I draw more from, from the, the conversation. Um, so while the global conversation in recent years about Syrian refugees has been mostly about Syrian refugees and the you know, so-called existentialist threat that they seem to pose to Europe, I'd like to talk a minute about Syria as a place of refuge. And we can put aside whether a place of ref refuge can also be a home. But I don't know how many of you think of Syria as a place of refuge as opposed to a source of refugees. But for over a century, easily, Syria, different waves of fleeing populations have found a place in Syria. I don't... I, I won't speak for each of them. It's for you know, it's for individuals to say whether or not they found a home, but we can say that they did find a place. Whether it was the Armenians fleeing genocide, Palestinians fleeing dispossession, the Lebanese fleeing their civil war, Iraqis fleeing the American invasion, uh, and it wasn't the government, but the people themselves that made room. So, which makes me think that the whole concept of karma is a fucking joke. But anyway, um, <laughs> sorry, sorry. One of the, um, so one of the many places I followed Syrians to as the country unraveled was Yerevan, Armenia, and I went in the fall of 2012. Uh, and that's because I was hearing about how Armenians were getting, uh, Syrian Armenians were getting citizenship in Armenia. And for those of you who don't know, Armenians have been in Syria since at least the 11th century, even so much before the genocide. In fact, religiously inspired Armenians, um, Armenia was one of the first countries to, as a whole, convert to Christianity, had been traveling and settling in the area long before that, especially near Balad al-Sham, sites of Christian pilgrimage, so in Palestine and, and other places. Um, many of these Armenians had long been Arabicized, but they maintained their religious customs. Of course, in the early 20th century, as the Ottoman Empire sought to exterminate them, they fled to Syria and their numbers swelled. And they, many of them found refuge in, in Aleppo, and that's because the, the train that deported them from Anatolia and parts north of the Ottoman Empire, the, cap, like the head of the line was in Aleppo. And from there, many people were forced to march into the desert, into the Syrian desert, uh, where, they, where they died, and where even today the bones of, of people who died in the desert blend with the, with the grains of sands near Deir Zor. Um, but those who survived began to pick up the pieces of their lives in Syria, and specifically in, in Aleppo. And the refugee camps for Armenians in Aleppo would later become bustling Armenian neighborhoods as tents became cement dwellings and the camps evolved from limbo to permanency. Uh, many Armenians stayed, made Syria their home, and became Syrian. The community numbered an estimated 150,000 at its peak in the 1990s. 
I'm going to jump ahead because I can already tell that this is, so you get the idea, things, you know, this, a, a, a community that had been almost exterminated has sort of re, retake, this is Western Armenians with a different language from what is spoken in today's Armenia, which is Eastern Armenia. So they sort of like re, resuscitated this, this civilization in Syria and they went on to populate diasporas across, you know, the United States, Montreal, Los Angeles, for, the, for those of you who know. Um, and then in the years before 2011, members of the Syri uh, numbers of Syrian Armenians had begun to visit Armenia during the summer because Armenia was also courting them. The Syrian Armenian population was quite wealthy, industrious. And so in June 2012, when many of them had come on their regular summer vacations to Armenia, they found themselves, you know, the, a month later in Aleppo in their home city, um, is er, violent battles erupted between the regime and armed rebels and Syrian families vacationing, Syrian Armenian families vacationing in Yerevan kept putting off their return until things cooled down in Aleppo. And instead things only deteriorated and many would end up staying years and in fact have now taken on Armenian citizenship. So one of the first Syrians to see the writing on the wall was a man named Anto who I write about in my book. His family originally came from Urfa in Turkey in, in the days of the Ottoman Empire where his great grandfather had been the local puppeteer beloved by Armenians and Turks alike. Like. In 1950, it was the Turks that warned him, warned him that something was coming and that he should make a run for it. And so he got a head start. He packed his puppets, dug up his gold, and with his family walked to Aleppo. In Syria, Anto had run the generations old family restaurant in Idlib that his family had opened up. They still lived in Aleppo, but they had a summer restaurant in Idlib. Um, like his great grandfather, he also got a head start. When after religious extremist fighters began moving in, a local friend told him, you're like an Arab in Tel Aviv, suggesting, that's so problematic, I know, but <laughs> suggesting he should think about staying in Aleppo and not coming back to Idlib. And the warnings from his neighbor, as the warnings became more explicit, he realized it was time to go because it echoed what Anto's father, who like his father before him, who had been born in Syria, used to tell him, reporting what had been passed down through generations. Like we came from Turkey, we may also one day leave from Syria. This was something that really stuck with me as in our conversations. He ended up moving his family to Yerevan and opening a restaurant a year before the other Syrian Armenians began to even consider doing the same. He mounted a large flat screen TV in the restaurant and set the satellite dish to channels from Syria. That's where, when in August of 2012, he watched, when the historic souks of Aleppo burned, he watched them on his, on his TV in the restaurant in, in Yerevan. So I asked him during one of our many conversations, how did he feel now? Um, and he said, he had said to me, face ID, um, he, he had said to me that I cannot cry now. I have no time. I have to feed my family. I have to survive in this new country. If my situation gets better and I can relax, I will cry. And he took a sip of coffee and he said, I do miss the past. And I think many of us Syrians are sort of like here all about all this nostalgia. But he planned to keep moving forward and keep, keep, keep keeping jovial for, for the business. And then he also said to me, and this was another thing that sort of, you know, he said he wasn't even sure anymore which were the events and the places to be mourned, Urfa, Idlib, Aleppo. He's now in Canada, by the way. I had been an optimist initially about what might happen in Syria, but that optimism began to seem naive as the years moved on. While in Yerevan, what really gripped me was how 100 years ago, Syria had offered to decimate a people refuge and home and life. And as Syria came apart, the reality was that now it offered safety to no one. This included the many ethnically Armenian Syrians who were more fortunate than other Syrians able to wait out the violence in Armenia. But unlike other Syrians, they had landed in a place that wished them to stay and was actively courting them. I began to wonder about all the possible futures. So here were the questions that I started to ask and still I'm asking, would Armenians go back to Syria? Would they become a bridge between a new Syria and the Caucasus? Would their presence in history in Syria, which once seemed innate, as did the Jews, who were all but gone by 1992, as do for now the Christians, recede? Would those who left be replaced with newcomers to Syria? After all, we have heard about all the foreign fighters who came seeking fame, fortune, redemption, meaning whatever, in Syria. Would their children become the new Syrians? And the other questions that would continue to plague me. Were waves of expulsion, migration, refuge, and exile just the natural course of things? No tragedy greater or less than another. Was permanence only ever illusory? These pictures have nothing to do with this. And I kept asking these questions as the situation only got worse. So to jump to one of these other threads, in 2015 I was back in the US. I was working on the book, I had a deadline for this book, and I was watching as Syrians and Iraqis and Afghans for the most part, no coincidence obviously, began seeking safety far beyond
beyond their immediate Beyond their, beyond their immediate borders. Lebanon, Jordan, Turkey, Iraq, Egypt, and North Africa had collectively already taken an estimated 4.8 million Syrian refugees. But if those countries were safer places to be, they did not provide an opportunity for a life. Instead, those host countries were limbos, where Syrians for the most part were unable to work, study, and earn a livelihood. Such activities were greatly curtailed, if not outright prohibited, and people began to look west. And that's when we start, I'm just gonna jump ahead for time. And so we saw people, we saw Syrians who didn't have the right kinds of passports or the right kind of travel documents. Um, an estimated half a million, in fact, take to the sea just in 2015 alone. Not all of them would make it alive. At least 3,500 3, people drowned at sea trying to reach Europe. Most had their sights set on Germany, the country that had essentially opened a door to them. And in the fall of 2015, watching all this from the United States, I made the journey, I went to Turkey and Greece and made the journey as a journalist with many of these Syrians. After all, I had lived a version of it, of it myself. While my family's life had been marked by relative success and lived in freedom of the United States, the process of becoming a part of a place that we personally had no roots in and hadn't planned on making home was complex and not unfamiliar. Obviously in 2015, the refugees arriving in Europe and Europe itself were clearly going through a similar, if not hyper-accelerated process of becoming a part of each other. So those questions raised by this massive migration weren't just personal, they had also been the object of my professional work, whether as a lawyer or as a journalist. So I felt like I was steeped in where they had come from, working on a book on Syria, and I had an idea of where they were headed, having written a book about multicultural Arab and Muslim America. So I went to, armed with an American passport and hence the ability to cross borders with dignity, my Syrian is always just a thing of exotic curiosity to border, cross, border guards across Europe who would always ask me when they saw me speaking to, to people without the right passports, hey, how do you speak their language? And I posed, I don't know, I, they all wanted pictures with me. So I've posed with like border guards from Macedonia all the way up to Germany. I was like, they're like a Syrian unicorn for them. Anyway, um, on the so-called refugee trail, as I watched people cling to the few belongings they had chosen to bring with them, I was constantly reminded of how different their, their leaving Syria was from my own departure. I had left, my mom had left pregnant with me. Only the vagaries of fortune separated us. While I was in Kos, Greece, and I'm gonna to jump to another part of the reporting, I met, I was drawn to a group of Syrians who were drinking coffee together, but didn't seem a natural fit. They spoke in different accents. I could hear people from Damascus, from the coast, from the Mediterranean coast, from Idlib. They included children, a veiled woman, two young women in shorts who could have passed for European tourists, and two men, one as strapping and confident as the other was skinny and unsure. The latter two, Muhammad and Muhannad, turned out to be pastry chefs, and they had been competitors back in Syria, but they had set out together to go to Sweden with the plan to open the mother of all pastry shops. Um, the slight one, with the little one, Muhammad, was married to the veiled woman, and three of the children belonged to them. Um, the blonde and the red-headed young woman were sisters from Damascus. Their mother, the daughter of Palestinian refugees, had recently left her husband and had come with, with her children in the hopes of making it to the Netherlands where, their other, where another one of their sisters had made it. She also had a teenage son. Yusuf had been teaching himself how to swim watching on YouTube how people swim in the event that they capsized during their crossing. But his sisters had insisted he learn by doing, and so while they waited for days in Turkey for the smugglers to secure their passage, they hurriedly taught him how to tread water. Wearing bikinis, they had passed for the tourists who frolicked near them on the same beaches. No one had noticed that they were rehearsing for their lives. I approached them all in the garden and we began to talk. I learned that they hadn't known each other before, but I just met days before when the rubber dinghy they had shared with 40 other people had broken down in the Aegean Sea. This group had worked together to get everybody to shore and were sticking together as they made the journey, as they waited for permission from the Greeks to make the journey onward. They each had in mind specifically different things, but generally what they wanted was life, safety, dignity, and opportunity. I asked if I could join them and as they made their way to their respective destinations, and they said yes. And so I traveled with them to Germany. Um, Sweet, and they went on to Germany, Sweden, and the Netherlands. And since then, I've been back um, once a year. And in fact, I'm headed to, to Sweden after, after here to, to follow up on their lives. Um, Unfortunately, it's always in winter, and unfortunately, they didn't end up in Portugal, Spain, and Italy, but okay. Um, and I've been to parts of Sweden that most Swedes have not been to because this is where they put, they put these Syrians. But the pastry shop, they didn't open the pastry shop together, but one of them just did a conditori, and it's huge, and it's amazing. And if you find yourself in southern Sweden, I'll, I'll give you the address. Um, the other family, which sort of passed more for white, has been the subject of the dispatches I've been writing for the New York Times Magazine in the At War section. And the idea is sort of about when home becomes unattainable came from the one I just did on Swad, the daughter who had done the original migration and, and, who's, and, and sort of set the course for her family. And when we were speaking 
about her displacement. So in the last seven years, she, since she had left Syria, she has lived in Jordan, Turkey, and the Netherlands where she was bounced between five different refugee camps. She told me that the concept of home became so unattainable that she learned to live without it. And she told me that instead she was looking to find herself much more than she is a home. And you can, you can read the piece. But indeed, many of the conversations I've been having as I do this reporting are not about home anymore. And this is where I return to. Can the concept be dispensed with? What changes when we dispense with the concept? What replaces it? Again, I don't see my job as answering these difficult questions, but really just posing them. And I just want to say, in the Syrian case, unlike the Palestinian case, there is pressure. Everyone wants the Syrians to return. Um, but I, I feel like it's necessary to say at least this, um, that returning to Syria is out of the question without justice and accountability. And with, with, with few exceptions, does not seem to be on the global agenda. I know some refugee Syrians in Norway just joined some of the universal jurisdiction cases. Um, Against, against the regime, but this is something also to think about. If we're unwilling to, to do what it takes to create a situation where home has a meaning even in, in, in the home country, then also what replaces this. And I don't think this question is only for Syrians to answer. How much time do I have? Okay, because I was supposed to do a reading. That's not gonna happen. Um, there's other things to say, but. <laughs> do you guys, are you in the mood for a reading? Uh, that wasn't, or yes? Okay, I'll try really, really, really quick. Um, oh God, can you put some lights on? As I told you, I was born in 1974, I can't see anything. Um, I really can't see. Okay, that's better. So on one, this comes from my last weekend in Damascus before I had to leave in 2013. I moved there in 2011. I spent the first two years of the uprising um, there, reporting anonymously for, for several outlets um, and working on this book, which, is, which I'm not gonna talk about in detail, but just to give you some flavor. On one of my final afternoons in Damascus, I stood on the front balcony of my grandmother's house, running my fingertips farewell over the leaves of a bitter orange tree whose upper branches reached our second story flat. I did not know if I'd ever be able to return, and if so, when that would be, and what I would or wouldn't find if I did. But unlike so many Syrians who had already fled the country, often on a day they hadn't known would be their last in their homes, I was leaving somewhat on my terms. I was able to say goodbye, and I did, to everything, alive and dead, sentient or not. Because Friday is the day of rest in Syria, there was hardly any traffic noise. People were at home. Moving by car had become cumbersome, with all the checkpoints halting the flow. Only mortar and gunfire rumbled in the distance. It was also Orthodox Good Friday, and many of the city's Christians would wait until later that night to decide whether to attend services. My grandmother Selma's apartment in the Tahan building now was was now restored, almost exactly as it had been in her day, and I lived in it alone, though always accompanied by her ghost and those of the others who had passed through it. From the balcony, I looked up and down the block. The trees, many of them citrus, were lush with leaves. Delicious loquats, academia, were hanging in little clusters from branches tauntingly close. And as in many parts of Damascus, I could smell the jasmine. Um, my parents wanted the house in Damascus because nearing their own years of retirement, they missed home, and their desire to return to Syria had begun to outweigh their need for sure footing in the United States. They were established in Baltimore and could begin to dream again of Syria. After taking the house back, they had decided to restore it, though with the exception of updates to the bathroom and kitchen, we did not really change it. None of us knew now if, it would ever see, if we would ever see it again or spend any time in it, as no one knew anymore who would possess the country or the house in the future. As I began to lose myself in these thoughts, I looked across at the neighbors watching me from their balconies. Our shared street was narrow and we could easily talk to each other over the divide. We saw each other there every day when we had our morning coffee still in our bathrobes, when we wrung and hung the laundry at midday, when we smoked an afternoon cigarette, when we watered the plants at sunset, and when we cracked sunflower seeds with friends and family and chatted into the night. After the violence started, we'd often rush out onto our balconies to figure out together what had just happened and really to be a little less alone in our fear. Christian and Muslim, we'd always wished one another a healthy year during our respective holidays, shared our best home cooking, and ululated for the neighborhood's new brides and grooms when they left their parents' homes. As I smiled and waved at the family across the street that afternoon, a gust of wind came through and we all heard a crash. We looked around until one of the neighbor's children pointed to a higher balcony next door to me. A birdcage had fallen onto the roof of a tiny one-story shop below, and a colorful parakeet was hopping around, dazed. The bird's owner came running out onto his balcony. Salam, he greeted all of us, and we hurriedly told him what had happened, gesturing to the bird on the loose. Someone yelled down to the young boys kicking a ball on the street, telling him to scale the shop's roof and catch the bird before it could escape. 
Indeed, instead, the boys startled the, bur the bird and it flew to my balcony. Everyone yelled at me to grab it, but it fluttered and perched out of my reach. The owner laughed and told us not to worry. This bird wanted to come back to its cage, he assured us. We all tried to coax it back, me especially, as I was still the nearest to the bird. But then it flapped frantically and suddenly flew away in a flash of green and yellow. Freedom, laughed the owner. At least for him, someone answered. We looked around nervously because, you know, Mukhabarat, and hoped that no one who might inform on us had heard our transgression. Poor thing, a woman covered for us all. Cat will get him. Thinking it better to avoid any further metaphorical conversation, I retreated from the balcony into the house to continue packing. I had not had time to furnish the house completely. Most of it was still empty. My footsteps echoed loudly. Only the master bedroom and my office were complete. My father and I had picked out the furniture together when he had come to visit in November of 2011, before he knew he was ill, though the disease had been progressing for years. During that trip, he was still hoping against hope that Syria wasn't about to leave him. In the bedroom, he had kept pajamas, and in the bathroom, as I began removing my own toiletries, I saw the razor and shaving cream he had tucked away for his return. Staring at these small items, I thought of all the little and big things Syrians all over the country had left behind, thinking they were coming back. And as happens in war and displacement, I wondered who would use them again first, their owners, if they lived, or those who would squat or borrow houses and things that weren't theirs, but at least for the time being, appeared to be abandoned. I too decided to leave things in Selma's house, as if to reassure her that I would return. Most importantly, I left a framed picture on my nightstand of me as a child, laughing with her and my sister in a moment of silliness, just months before her terrible fate would befall her.